We now live in an era where, in an information society, mathematics can protect us, and we should use strong mathematics to encrypt, to conceal, and to give integrity, confidentiality, back to our technological communications, to ensure that we can have dignity in the rest of our lives and agency as we move through this world. The US government, my government, says that the best way to defend, of course, is to build a massive multi-billion dollar attack program, which they've been using to spy on everyone from Chancellor Merkel to, well, frankly, just regular EU and American citizens, as well as citizens and regular human beings all over the whole planet. Instead of actually spending that billion dollars on building secure systems, they are building arms and leaving systems insecure. And then they are using those digital arms, or D-weapons, if you will, to essentially attack systems that they think are of value. So one of the things that we've seen them do is that in the name of national security, they've broken into Belgacom and attack the telephone systems, which are the core infrastructure of the Belgian telephone system. And the reason they did this was not because a terrorist used them, but because maybe someday a terrorist might use them. So what we see with Edward Snowden is that that is completely false. We see that the wiretapping is without limits for the whole planet, wherever it is technically possible, they are doing it. And everyone that chooses surveillance chooses effectively, right on the spot, to be beholden to anyone that performs more powerful surveillance than they do. So the UK and the USA are at the top, and let's say Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, they're at the next level of the pyramid. The Netherlands is somewhere around there or the, the following level. And the issue is not that there isn't some security to be had. The issue is that the security is a matter of benevolence from everyone above you in the pyramid. So for example, other countries like Argentina, they're a lot closer to the bottom of that. Or for example, Nigeria, a lot closer to the bottom. Or Kenya, a lot closer to the bottom. And the fallacy we see is that total surveillance of the infrastructure, such as the phone system in Kenya, which is one of the programs that has been revealed by Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras with the Edward Snowden files, what we see is that even with that total surveillance, you still have the Westgate shopping mall terrorist attack, and it is not stopped, because surveillance itself is not security. It does bring an ability for control, but it does not bring security. And in fact, it brings great insecurity. And it does not in any way stop, as some people claim, these attacks. And in fact, those attacks are not only still carried out, those attacks are carried out, and then they say, and isn't it great that we have surveillance? Which doesn't even logically follow. The thing to understand is that the intelligence community's tools of today are the commercial products of control society companies tomorrow. So for example, we see groups um, like FinFisher or Hacking Team where they sell implants and they bundle them with exploits so you can break into a person's computer. And they're not as sophisticated in the commercial world, but they're effectively the same. Yeah, I was saying since, um, since 2008, the security sector in Egypt developed much interest in expanding their abilities to be able to uh, uh, have more surveillance equipment and tools and access more private information and to be able to remotely hack different people's equipments uh, and access their uh, emails, phone books, SMS, uh, online communication, etc. Uh, they were able to do much of this through the cooperation with the companies in the country. And the other part, they were able to do it by uh, buying new products from uh, surveillance technologies companies. Uh, like they have got uh, Fred Fisher, uh, they have RCS, they have Blue Coach, uh, and different kinds of offensive software technologies. If you, for example, sell FinFisher to a country that is a dictatorship, it's not, even if it's lawful, it's not in line with human rights. 
to sell them those tools. You could argue that it could be used lawfully, but it's very difficult to argue that when you sell to Morocco tools for breaking into computers and the documented cases are journalist computers, it's very difficult to argue that that's a legitimate dual use. It's very, very difficult to make that argument. The U.S. government, as an example, uh, stockpiles uh, what are known as zero days. And what we could just say is they found a defect in a piece of software. Sometimes it's a critical piece of software, like a centrifuge for refining chemicals, let's say, which you might argue they would like to find a defect in that because they'd like to stop people from doing that. And we could make good arguments about what defects are good to hide, what defects are important to fix. But an important point is that Zero-day exploits essentially are a way to take a defect and give a power advantage to another person. So for example, you have a mail server at your company and you use it for sending email. Such a defect, or a vulnerability as we might call it, is something that will allow someone to reach into the mail server and take your email. So absent of a back door, they basically break in. So imagine that your window is unlocked and they open the window and they reach in. The vulnerability is that it was unlocked, or that the glass was small and thin and could be broken. However, in most cases, it's something much more complicated than that. And it's something that's much more critical. It's like saying, for example, when you look at a city, that there's a power grid, and this power grid, if you just turn off the power, you would be able, for example, to like stop something at a building nearby speculatively. But it turns out that defect if you don't fix it, sometimes the power will just go out anyway. And sometimes someone else may knock the power out. That is to say, it's not exclusively like a window in a particularized place. It is the case that it's a systemic failure. It's all the mail servers like your mail server or web browsers like that. And a zero day exploit is essentially this vulnerability turned into a tool where someone can use it in their favor. But because you know about it, you know about this defect, it also allows someone else to find it, potentially, as these defects are not uniquely yours. They're not even geographically bounded. These are traded, essentially like weapons are traded. And they're used in such a way that there's a tension. The same people that are responsible for keeping us safe are leaving these defects in so that they can use zero-day exploits to be able to break into computers, like burglars, and to rob them of their secrets, their values, and to control them in some way, to disrupt. War. We thought we would be freed from them. But invisible wars are fought in the digital war zone with weapons called backdoors in zero days. Holes and defects in the software that we use every day. When these zero day exploits go unresolved, they allow an attacker to take control of important digital infrastructure. In 2010, we became aware that the United States and Israel concerted a digital attack on the uranium enrichment plants of Iran using such zero-day exploits and a piece of software called Stuxnet. In 2014, we learned about Regime, a digital weapon used by the British GCHQ to break into computers of Belgian telecom provider Belgacom. Regine and Stuxnet are pieces of malicious software made by governments to spy on others. Commercial firms are also involved in this digital arms race. Gamma International sells Finn Fisher surveillance software to regimes all over the world, including Bahrain, to monitor our space. AMSYS sold surveillance software to the Gaddafi regime. Bluecoat sold to Syria. Even if we do not see it, it is still there. As an example, as part of the so-called arms race, the National Security Agency of the United States has pushed NIST, the, Na the National Standards Institute for Cryptography and other related issues, it's actually pushed them to put in backdoored cryptographic standards. That is, they do not behave in the way they are specified. They're supposed to be, say, secure. In the case of a random number generator, it's supposed to give random numbers. And this gives security to cryptographic systems. So when a president makes a phone call, uh, when you make a banking transaction, random numbers are a critical part of that. And as part of this so-called arms race, the NSA actually sabotaged the critical infrastructure of the United States by giving a backdoored random number generator instead of a truly secure random number generator, a truly entropic random number generator. And what this has done is it has undermined our ability to trust the standards organization as being an impartial body that tells us the truth. 
So part of the arms race that we see here is that we can no longer trust our institutions to actually be do to actually be doing what they are supposed to be doing. And that as an arms race component is very non obvious to anyone. I mean, this is horrific, actually. If you cannot trust the state who is supposed to represent you, who is supposed to, in some sense, protect you, who will you trust? How will you trust anyone or anything? Ten years ago, when we talked about mass surveillance systems, or five years ago when we talked about how they were being deployed by companies like AIMSYS, or when we looked at, in fact, how the surveillance was being used and people revealed, like John Getz, revealed parts of the drone wars which are being tied to these kinds of surveillance programs, to understand the big picture, over time we've revealed that these things exist and we've been building protections. So the good news is that on the whole scale of things, we're winning. So come win with us.